Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Alice Adams with Espresso Tutorials. Today we're speaking with author Janet Salmon about her book First Steps in SAP S4 HANA Finance. Hello Janet. Hello Alice. <laughs> Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Yeah, I can do. So, you know, my day job is I'm the chief product owner for management accounting, which means I'm part of the development organization at SAP in Waldorf in Germany. And I work with the CO teams developing pretty much everything that you see that's new in Espahana Finance. I've got a long history in controlling. I've been with SAP 26 years and spent most of my time close to the development organization there. Been living in Germany for 26 years as well, but you know, if you're worrying about my accent, I was originally British. Excellent, thank you. Well, I think we can go ahead and get started. So this sounds very formal, I'm talking about completing this session, but this is really the main things that I'm going to walk you through. Essentially, how the financial accounts and the cost elements come together, bringing FI and CO together in the Universal Journal, because I think that's really the heart of the book. A lot of people have been kind of perturbed by that and said, well, doesn't it just mean that you've got an awful lot of accounts and cost elements in CO, and how do you keep the overview of that? So I'm going to talk about something that I didn't actually have when I wrote the book a couple of years ago, and this is the ability to tag the accounts and make them available for reporting, which I think is quite exciting. Another thing that a lot of people have asked me recently, they said, you know, it's great what you've done putting the different modules together and putting everything to a single journal entry, but, you know, we really struggle with our cost center hierarchies and our profit center hierarchies and our cost element groups. And is there a better way of doing some of these things? So I'll talk about a couple of things that have come along that are new since I wrote the book. Okay, so if, if I had to say what was the heart of the book, it's probably this slide. You know, if you really understood this slide, you don't need to read my book. What we're trying to say with this slide is, what's happened, how different modules have come together, and how everything lands in this thing called a universal journal. Now, when the SAP components were originally designed, some people are going to be old enough that they can remember the individual component pictures, where you had the general ledger in financial accounting, you had the CO modules, you had a fixed asset accounting, you had MM and inventory management, and of course you had profitability analysis. And the idea way back when, certainly when I joined SAP back in 1992, was that customers would put in those individual components individually. So people might start and they'd put in their general ledger and they'd put in some basic cost center accounting, but they'd do asset accounting later. And they'd maybe put profitability analysis and product costing in later. Or they would choose what they did depending on their location. So they might be running asset accounting in their manufacturing locations, but not out at their sales locations. And so the original design was very much about all these components to be able to interact with each other, but also to operate separately. Now, what we typically find now is everybody does one thing. They do pretty much all the components. It's rare now to encounter a customer who said, you know, I'm not doing asset accounting. If they've got assets, they're pretty much likely to be managing them in the SAP system. And to reflect this, we've tried to simplify our architecture and bring all the transactional data for each of these separate components into one table. And that's this universal journal. So if you think about what happens from a reporting point of view, you're really getting what an accountant that I'm friends with described as the ultimate pivot table. It's the pivot table that has all the general ledger dimensions in it. So it's got ledger, it's got company code, it's got account, it's got profit center in it. It's got all the CO account dimensions. So it's got cost center, it's got order, it's got project, it's got business process. It's got all the COPA characteristics. So whatever market segment dimensions you've activated in your operating concern. So that might be product, customer, customer group, product hierarchy, region, brand, you name it. And then it's going to have things like the assets in there and it's going to have the materials in there for the material ledger. So it's very much bringing together everything that's important. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that you lose the idea of the individual components. You're still going to be running allocations and settlement in CO. You're still going to be acquiring assets in asset accounting and capitalizing assets under construction. You're still going to be doing your material movements via the material ledger. You're still going to have your revenues and deliveries flowing through COPA. But the idea is that all of these different business transactions are landing in this one central universal journal. 
And there'll be some reporting dimensions that are always filled, like company code, profit center, account will always be filled. And other fields will be filled depending on the application. So I'm only going to fill a fixed asset if I've actually acquired a fixed asset or depreciated a fixed asset or what have you. And I'm only going to have material filled if I've got a goods movement or I've got a sale in COPA. So what we get into is something that feels like a very big COPA, where you've got some dimensions that are not assigned. Not every field will be filled in every transaction, and others that will be always filled. But it means you can really drill down very, very freely in this data structure. One of the other things that had to happen to make these data structures come together was we had to bring together disparate things. And one of the ultimate disparate things with my history of CO was always, you know, what is a cost element? We, I've always spent a lot of my life explaining how the profit and loss accounts, how they marry primary cost elements, how you've got primary cost elements for things like wages, salaries, materials, depreciation, and so on. And then how you've got all these secondary cost elements for all your allocations, your direct activity allocations, your, your assessments, your settlements, and so on. And what happens as you go into the material, into the universal journal, is you get this one field, the account, which might be a profit and loss account, it might be a balance sheet account, it might be a secondary cost element. The business processes per se remain similar, but everything's coming together under this account and cost element. And it takes away a lot of that feeling that there's strange things going on in CO, and I then need a reconciliation ledger to bring that information back into the universal journal. I now can't move costs in controlling without them showing up in the general ledger. Everything's inherently reconciled. It can't be out of sync. The other thing that this thing does really powerfully is keeping everything at the same granularity. So if you think what often happens in asset accounting, I acquire 20 assets. I've got a great long list of assets. I derive the cost center from there, and I summarize up to a single line in cost center accounting, and I maybe have a couple of accounts behind them for the asset acquisition in the general ledger. So I've got three documents reflecting one transaction. I've bought a group of assets, but all at different granularities. And what effectively happens now is I've got my asset document with the 10 assets attached. It's picking up the cost center that those assets are going to be attached to when they come to depreciate. And it's picking up the accounts that I'm storing that asset information on. So it really takes away one of those headaches of controlling financial accounting in the past, that whole reconciliation piece, because I have one document, and if that business transaction goes through and I manage to post, I have everything I need already pre-sorted in the Universal Journal. So just to dive a little bit more deeply into what I said about the account and the cost element, I think this is one of the fundamental things to understand. So when I learned cost accounting way back when, you would talk about the accounts in the general ledger, and they would either be balance sheet accounts or they would be profit and loss accounts. So we had two classifications, balance sheet or profit and loss. And then as you went across into CO, any of those profit and loss accounts that you were going to associate with a cost center, an order, a project, or revenue cost elements that you were going to associate with your COPA dimensions, you had this sister cost element that was tied to that P&L account. And really, it was, it was a double entry. It was two separate ways of seeing the same thing. But there was always a one-to-one -one relationship with the two of them. So what happens when we convert to S4 now is we, we migrate them and bring those two elements together. What would happen with the secondary cost elements is I would def define them for all the different purposes of moving costs in CI, so it might be for an assessment cycle to move marketing costs into COPA. It might be for a direct allocation to move production costs via an activity type onto the production orders. It might be about booking professional services from a cost center to a project. It might be settlement, taking internal orders and charging them to COPA. And what we had in the past, in days before the new general ledger, was we had a reconciliation ledger that was sitting there and saying, if any of these sender-receiver relationships that I'm posting with my secondary cost elements result in a change of company code, I need to store a document and update this later. The new general ledger went a stage further and actually posted that reconciliation document immediately. What happens in the new world is every time I have a sender-receiver relationship being updated on one of those secondary cost elements, it's going to update 
the partners in the relationship. So if you mention a cost center allocation, I've got some kind of service cost center allocating out to all my production cost centers. I've got sender cost centers and I've got receiver cost centers. And those cost centers are going to be assigned to things like profit centers, functional areas, business areas, and so on. And that allocation will typically be also moving them between profit centers, moving them between functional areas. And that's going to show up in my reporting under the partner object. So I'm going to see it's going from profit center A to profit center B, the partner profit center, functional area A to functional area B, and so on. So it really gives us that multidimensional reporting without actually making a massive change, either to where you capture those initial costs or what you do in CO terms in terms of allocations and settlement structure and so on. So I talked about reporting, but of course, a table on its own is not actually that easy to report on. Of course, in the development world, we look at the tables all the time. We look at the table contents. But since um, Sarbanes-Oxley, most normal users don't actually have access to the tables directly. So the idea is for reporting purposes, we put a layer on top of this. And the layer that we put on top of this is called this virtual data model. And what this virtual data model does is it translates that raw table content into something that I can report on. Now, it might be that I report on that directly. I'm using fact sheets. I'm using some of the new Fiori applications. It might be that I'm using some of the business object tools that read that those contents, I might also be using it to extract data into BW. But the idea is I'm converting those application tables. So if you can imagine, the Universal Journal will typically have 340 to 370 fields, depending on how many characteristics you've got live in COPA, how many, field, how many industry solutions you've added, whether you've got any extensions in there. That's the raw data, the pure fields that I can use in multidimensional reporting. But if I actually want to turn it into something that's a little bit more user-friendly, I'm also going to be including in there things like attributes for the master data. So typically, things like cost center, profit centers, and so on, they have a manager who's responsible. I don't store that information in the transactional data itself. It's tagged as an attribute to the cost center. But I want to be able to include that in reporting. Texts are another really good example. A lot of our customers are running the system in 30 or 40 languages. And we don't want to write the text for each of these fields in 30 or 40 languages in the application table itself. There's a separate text table. And when I actually run the report, it reads me the information and gives it me in English, French, German, whatever it is I need. And then, of course, there's the hierarchy information. We've also, we're also going to be talking in a little while about what we do in terms of hierarchies in the virtual data model to translate those flat structures in something hierarchical that users can use for reporting. And typically, this virtual data model is pretty well hidden when you're working with it. It's what my group work with when we're building new applications, whether it's new applications like MySpend or just reworking those standard reports like the trial balance, the cost center report, and so on. And they can actually be quite complex. You know, you will also in CO find yourself using the virtual data model, not just to pull together your actual costs. You'll also be bringing in things like plan costs and so on. It's quite a powerful model. So if you see what you can do with it, this is what happens when we start to consume that virtual data model. So what you see on the left in all of these reports are essentially fields in the Universal Journal that have been converted into something that I can use for reporting using this virtual data model. And these are just some of the standard reports that some of my teams have built. And they probably don't look that exciting. So you've got a profit and loss report. On the left, it's structured by account. It's something people have been doing in accounting for 40, 50 years in software. I mean, if you think SAP has been around for 40 years, I'm pretty sure there was a P&L statement in the very first version. It's just a way of structuring the account information by financial statement version and showing the values on each account. But where this solution starts to get powerful is that P&L statement in the old world was very much driven by the dimensions either in the classic general ledger, so you could really only drill down easily by company code and business area. As you move into the new general ledger, you start to be able to include things like profit center, functional area, trading partner, and so on. And now that list just, just explodes. It suddenly becomes really easy to drill down by cost center, to drill down by all the COPA dimensions, to drill down by 
orders, projects, and of course, there's partner objects that I was looking at when I was talking about secondary cost elements. And that's something that's really powerful. Everything's in one place. Everything's multidimensional. And I don't have to move this data to a, a system that's really dedicated for reporting. This is all happening using views straight off my core ERP data. It's a very powerful message because from a look, you know, the look isn't that exciting. It's a webbed pro application with a query in it. But the power is that this is instant information. As soon as there's a posting in there, I can view it real time, and I can start to drill down into all the dimensions. Here's another example, the trial balance. And I've deliberately chosen this example because trial balance is it's typically financial accounting. It's simply where I start where I typically start my period close, show me the balances on each of my accounts. And what you see up top is the standard drill down by GL account. I think in the standard delivery, it's drill down by GL account and company code. And what I've done here is I've actually done something that you would never normally see in the trial balance. I've brought in the CO information. You remember I said that the secondary cost elements are now part of the chart of accounts. They're accounts with a special type, S rather than P. And what we see here is actually a very, very classic CO charging model. I've got a production order, and it's been using repair hours, production hours, and machine costs. What I see on the drill down are the cost centers that supplied that activity, so technical services, quality inspection, pump assembly, quality inspection, and so on. And you also see what takes a little bit of getting used to it if you're from an FI world, where typically all your dimensions are filled. You can see that the sister of each of those entries is blank, not assigned. And that kind of makes you feel that it's broken. But it's not. The idea is that you would actually pull in the next dimension and say, that cost center was charging its cost to an order. The receiver was a production order in this case. And I could have continued with this example and shown not only the drill down by cost center, but also the drill down by order, just to understand how those costs are flowing through my organization. And then I could go further and start to drill down and understand how that movement from cost center to production has maybe resulted in a shift of profit centers or a shift in functional areas. Very, very powerful reporting. Very flexible, very easy to use and built, like I say, on top of the Universal Journal, which is our new simplified data structure, and consumed by this virtual data model that brings everything together for ease of consumption in these reports.